I've seen numerous examples in the past few years of people drawing on the Harry Potter series as a way of explaining various real-world political events. From people comparing Donald Trump or Tony Abbott or Viktor Orban or Brexit as a kind of thing to Voldemort or the various groups and individuals opposing them to Harry, Hermione, Dumbledore's army or Dumbledore himself. Some people find these allusions to be so reductive as to be incredibly irritating. And sometimes I agree, particularly when they appear in the pages of the New York Times or the Washington Post and the like, they certainly have an element of Pokemon go to the polls to them. Yet, when it comes to at least relatively young people engaging in this kind of discourse, I don't think it particularly surprising that a generation raised on Harry Potter might use it as a lens for making sense of the political events and predicaments taking place around them. For the most part, I don't think that anyone's suggesting that it's literally the same, it's simply a useful language to articulate where one stands politically. And if it gets people fired up about making the world a mildly better place, then that's broadly a positive, right? Nevertheless, in trying to make the events and characters of the Harry Potter series relevant to our present political moment, I think some of the actual political commentary which exists in these books and films gets lost a little. For particularly following the fifth, and to my mind best, entry in the series Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the Harry Potter books contains some very direct parodying and critique of the political events which were taking place surrounding their writing and release in the mid-2000s. It doesn't require one to read or watch too closely to notice that the series gets substantially darker as it proceeds. Yet, in recent years at least, I've only very rarely seen people draw the connection between this increasing darkness in the fictional world of Harry Potter and the other, less fictional narrative which dominated the years in which they were released that of the rise of contemporary terrorism and the introduction of various measures by governments both here in the UK and abroad supposedly designed to combat it. For it's more than simply timing which connects Harry Potter with the so-called War on Terror. From the Order of the Phoenix onwards, the series very regularly seeks to comment on both the increasing levels of fear in the global north and the often flawed ways in which governments were attempting, supposedly, to reassure their citizens. In fact, following the release of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, one reviewer wondered whether the series might have become so heavily invested in parodying the War on Terror that it might limit the ability of future readers to relate to it. Rowling's references to terrorism don't feel cheap, wrote Julia Turner for Slate magazine. They feel terrifying, but how will they read in 50 years? Turner's fears seem to have been misplaced. It may only have been 13 years since the final book was published and nine years since the final film was released, but it definitely feels like a very different political era. Nevertheless, as we've seen, young people and adults alike are still managing to connect with the wizarding world. My goal in this video then is not to argue that the Harry Potter series can only be read or watched as an allegory for the war on terror, or that it can tell us nothing at all about present social and political events. I do, however, want to try and recontextualise it a little within the socio-political environment in which it was conceived and draw out some of the specific ways in which these stories engaged with the tensions and traumas of the post 9-11 world. Of course, if you're new around here and this seems like your kind of thing, then please do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to get a buzz every time I put out a new video. And if you really like what I do, then I'd be very grateful if you'd consider supporting the channel on Patreon, where you can get early access to my videos along with copies of the scripts to them and more. With that out of the way, however, let's crack on with the video. The spectre of terrorism first rears its ugly head in Harry Potter during an early sequence in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, 
Following Ireland's victory in the Quidditch World Cup, celebrations in the camp where Harry, Hermione and the Weasleys are staying are cut short when a group of Death Eaters arrive and start burning tents and tormenting those assembled. This scene is notable in how much of a break this attack represents in the tactics employed by Voldemort and his accomplices. Previously in the series, Voldemort had acted with the help of only one or two others, and his plans to return to semi-human form had generally centred on mischievous plots to retrieve various magical artefacts. This is clearly something altogether different. Not only does the attack by the Death Eaters reveal that Voldemort has begun to attract or re-attract followers, it also hints at a change to his approach to secure power. He no longer only has his sights set on gaining physical form, but also on inducing fear in the whole of the British wizarding society in order to set the stage for his rise to power. Nevertheless, after this sequence, Goblet of Fire returns to Rowling's trusted formula of a race to obtain a magical object, a narrative structure which the series never really moves away from. And it's hard to say to what extent this scene, especially as it's written in the book, is intended to be a nod to contemporary terrorism. In his book The Irresistible Rise of Harry Potter, Andrew Blake suggests that the more fitting comparison might be with the often violent marches of fascist groups such as the British National Party, who, at the time of Goblet of Fire's publication, were gaining ground in British politics. Blake notes the fact that the attack takes place during a sporting event and suggests that this might parallel the long-standing connection in the UK between such right-wing groups and football hooliganism. Through this lens, one might see the attack on the Quidditch World Cup as not so much an invocation of terrorism, and instead simply as a continuation of the exploration of racism introduced in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Either way, once we reach the fifth book in the series, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the references to both the threat of terrorism and the responses of those in power to it become unmistakable. And it's impossible to discuss the shift in the fictional world of Harry Potter, which occurs between Goblet of Fire and the Order of the Phoenix, without first discussing the way in which the world into which these books were being released changed, whilst the latter book was being written. A year after the publication of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and for what it's worth, just over a month before the release of the first film, 19 members of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda hijacked four American passenger planes. Two of these they flew into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. Another they flew into the Pentagon Building in Virginia. The fourth plane, which it is believed that the hijackers planned to fly into the US Capitol building, crashed into a field in Pennsylvania whilst the passengers on board attempted to retake control. The events were tragic. 2,977 people died and more than 25,000 were injured. However one chooses to define it, the existence of terrorism far predated these attacks. Nevertheless, the scale of death and destruction which occurred on the 11th of September 2001 was far above and beyond anything that the world had seen before. As such, governments quickly leaped into action to give themselves the means to reduce the likelihood of any future similar events taking place. On the 16th of September 2001, George W. Bush declared a war on terrorism. Four days later, he retitled this conflict, The War on Terror. Our war on terror, he told Congress, begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped and defeated. Bush drew allusions to previous wars, to the Second World War and to the First Gulf War. As he acquiesced, however, this conflict was clearly different. It was not being waged against another nation state, but against an international network with no territory to its name. Moreover, as the attacks in London on the 7th of July 2005 would later prove, enemy combatants were as likely to be domestic citizens as foreign nationals. The plan to defeat this threat then had to also be different. In October 2001, Bush signed into law the USA Patriot Act which, believe it or not, is an acronym for Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism. 
Among other things, the act enabled the US government to engage in mass surveillance of the US population. As such, it was highly controversial. The American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, write that the Patriot Act was the first of many changes to surveillance laws that made it easier for the government to spy on ordinary citizens by expanding the authority to monitor phone and email communications, collect bank and credit reporting records, and track the activity of innocent Americans on the internet. While most Americans think it was created to catch terrorists, the Patriot Act actually turned regular citizens into suspects. Similar laws in other countries followed, attracting similar controversy. The debate surrounding such laws, it's important to note, did not hinge on whether government should have the ability to stop terrorism. Rather, it highlighted the manner in which the Patriot Act and its international equivalents did so through a significant curtailing of civil liberties. The right, for instance, to not have the government listening in to your phone calls. Given that, in his speech from the Oval Office on the evening of the 11th of September 2001, Bush had declared that what had come under attack on that day was our way of life, our very freedom. Critics questioned whether such laws might respond to one threat to freedom with another. The ways in which the Order of the Phoenix engaged with the change post 9-11 world it was released into begin subtly. During the opening scene of the film and first chapter of the book, a pair of Dementors appear in Little Whinging, the town in which Harry lives with his uncle, aunt and cousin, forcing Harry to conjure his Patronus. Having broken the rules surrounding using magic in front of a muggle, Harry is summoned to a hearing at the Ministry of Magic, the legislative and judiciary body of British wizarding society. The hearing marks the first time we see inside the Ministry of Magic. But more than this, it preludes the Ministry becoming a greater and greater presence in the series. See, in the early books and films, the Ministry remains firmly in the background. It is referenced a number of times, either due to Mr Weasley working there, or in order to explain the logistics of the Quidditch World Cup or Triwizard Tournament, but it's never a particularly active force in the narrative. From the Order of the Phoenix onwards, however, the changing priorities and leadership of the Ministry become of central importance to the story that is being told. Furthermore, more than simply becoming a greater presence in the story, it also increasingly comes to be an antagonistic force, secondary perhaps only to Voldemort himself. Now, during the events of the Order of the Phoenix, the Ministry chooses to ignore Harry's warning that Voldemort has returned. It briefs the Daily Prophet that Harry is lying about having witnessed Voldemort's return to sort of semi-human form at the end of the Goblet of Fire, and the Minister for Magic, Cornelius Fudge, reassures the wizarding world that all is well. In this, there is a clear disparity between the reaction of real-world governments to 9-11 and that of the fictional ministry to the return of Voldemort. Nevertheless, beyond this, their reactions have much in common. The Ministry appoints Professor Dolores Umbridge, first as Defence Against the Dark Arts teacher, then as High Inquisitor, and finally as Headmistress of Hogwarts. Umbridge is an oppressive enough presence as a teacher. As her power over life in Hogwarts increases, however, she is able to clamp down more and more on the basic freedoms of the school's students. Most notable is her introduction of a series of decrees, which soon threaten the structural integrity of the school in the pure number of them affixed to its walls. New rules created by these decrees include a ban on students being in possession of the Wizarding World's only alternative news source, the Quibbler, as well as a ban on students gathering in any meaningful number. In the book, Umbridge also reveals to Harry that all of the students' letters and communications to the outside world are being monitored. In order to enforce these decrees, Umbridge sets up an inquisitorial squad of students. This enables her to gain inside information on student activity, while also more broadly to turn students against one another and create a climate of suspicion. 
In all of this, there is a very clear allusion to the litany of laws that were passed in the wake of 9-11, which, under the guise of combating terrorism, severely infringed upon the freedoms of those living in the US, the UK and other countries. Umbridge's reign parodies not only the introduction of such laws and the furthering of the ability of governments to spy on their own citizens, but also the broad sense of fear such laws created. As legal scholar Judith Rauhofer writes, Rowling's use of the decrees highlights how the use of executive control without proper judicial oversight can lead to the suppression of dissent by those in power. In fact, I would go further to suggest that the books point to the impact that such laws can have on those who are completely innocent where, as the ACLU has it, the Patriot Act turned regular citizens into suspects, Umbridge's decrees create a similar legal framework and societal atmosphere in which everyone is assumed guilty until proven innocent. The most direct parodying of the post-9-11 political world in the Harry Potter series, however, occurs towards the beginning of the following entry in the series, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. In chapter 3 of the book, the Ministry, who, following the battle in its own headquarters at the end of the Order of the Phoenix, and the Death Eater's destruction of a bridge, in the films the Millennium Bridge in London, have now admitted to the return of Lord Voldemort, sends a pamphlet to all wizarding homes titled Protecting Your Home and Family Against Dark Forces. The pamphlet encourages families to be vigilant for Death Eater activity and to increase the security around their homes. This mirrors a similar document sent to all UK houses by the UK government in 2004 titled Preparing for Emergencies – What You Need to Know. Rauhofer writes that, like the wizarding leaflet, the government's advice was largely ignored when it arrived on people's doorsteps. Undoubtedly, it was intended to be a PR exercise, aiming to ease people's fears rather than providing real information which would be helpful in a crisis situation. Indeed, Tom Scott, now a YouTube creator, received a sternly worded email from the UK government after he created a parody of the leaflet's accompanying website which satirised its vague, often commonsensical advice. Rauhofer, however, suggests that the leaflet wasn't really intended to actually help people to be better equipped for emergencies, terrorist-related or otherwise, but was instead an example of what is referred to as security theatre. Bruce Schneier defines security theatre as the introduction of countermeasures which provide the feeling of security instead of the reality. In his book Beyond Fear, he suggests that much of the increased security which was introduced to airports following 9-11 served such a role. Despite the tragedy of that day, the posting of armed members of the National Guard at airports in the US was not intended to actually defend against any potential attacks. In fact, the troops' guns weren't even loaded, but simply to create the feeling of security. Now, the distribution of an unnecessary leaflet is a fairly harmless example of security theatre. Yet, there are a number of examples of this activity over efficacy response to the return of Lord Voldemort in the Half-Blood Prince having fairly devastating consequences. Chief among these is the arrest of Stan Shunpike, the conductor of the night bus under suspicion of Death Eater activity. It is well established in the books and in the film that Stan has a tendency to bend the truth a little in an attempt to impress. It turns out that Stan was merely overheard in the pub, claiming to have knowledge of the Death Eaters' plans, which, given the circumstances, seems shaky evidence. Nevertheless, the Ministry's desire to, as Hermione puts it, look as though they're doing something, results in him being sent to Azkaban anyway. Stan's arrest and conviction has a number of corollaries in the real-life War on Terror. Laws introduced in both the US and UK in the wake of 9-11 made it much easier for police officers and other law enforcement agencies to arrest and detain those suspected of being terrorists. In the UK, where one can usually be held for 24 hours before the police have to decide whether to charge you with a crime or let you go, following the introduction of the Criminal Justice Act of 2003, police forces could hold those suspected of terrorist offences for up to 14 days without charge. 
Church. And this ability to detain people who are only suspected of being involved in terrorist activity had inevitable consequences. In 2012, a student studying for a master's degree at the University of Nottingham was held for seven days without charge after downloading an Al-Qaeda manual for a US government website as part of his research. The worst examples of improper detainment in this period, however, undoubtedly relate to the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center, operated by the US but situated in Cuba. The camp was established in January 2002, with the intention of being a site to hold, in Donald Rumsfeld's words, extremely dangerous men. He continued that, Whatever the detainee's legal status may ultimately be determined to be, the important fact is that the detainees are being treated humanely. They have been, they are being treated humanely today, and they will be in the future. This, however, has not been the case. The camp soon became synonymous with inhumane conditions and torture. Detainees, moreover, were frequently held without trial with one US senator suggesting in 2006 that many of those held were arrested on the flimsiest sort of hearsay. In 2005, Irene Khan of Amnesty International described Guantanamo Bay as the gulag of our times, entrenching the notion that people can be detained without any recourse to the law. One such detainee was UK resident Shaka Amir, who was arrested whilst living in Afghanistan and held at Guantanamo for 14 years without trial. On his release in 2015, he described the conditions at the camp by telling reporters that, The closest thing for my mind is a Harry Potter story. They've got an island in Harry Potter, it says Azkaban where there's no happiness and they just suck all your feelings out of you and you don't have no feelings anymore. The analogy seems to work the other way around too, with Azkaban increasingly feeling like a stand-in for Guantanamo Bay during the later books. In fact, it's in this parallel between Azkaban and Guantanamo Bay that the shift in the series from the Order of the Phoenix onwards is most apparent. For when we're first introduced to the prison in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, its legitimacy as a way of punishing supposedly evil wizards, even when we learn of Sirius Black's false imprisonment, is never really questioned. We're made very aware of the dire conditions in Azkaban, yet Sirius's wrongful detention is presented almost as a one-off. Everyone else who resides there, we're encouraged to assume, actually does deserve it. It's worth pointing out that Azkaban does survive throughout the whole series. We learn at the end of Deathly Hallows that the Death Eaters and some others, including Umbridge, are sent to Azkaban for their complicity in Voldemort's brief takeover of the Ministry and the horrific acts which follow. Stan Shunpike's arrest, however, does, if briefly, encourage us to consider whether such a system in which those suspected of being evil are subjected to horrific and inhumane conditions can ever be viewed as morally acceptable, especially considering the possibility of wrongful conviction. It's one thing to point out all these connections between the later Harry Potter books and the War on Terror, yet it's another to ask what they might mean. Successful parody or satire doesn't only reference aspects of the world around it, but also says something about that which it mimics. And I think the most direct thing to take away from all of this is that none of the oppressive interventions brought in by the Ministry to combat the rise of Voldemort work. Umbridge's decrees, which are in fact intended to stop Harry's paramilitary counterinsurgency group, Dumbledore's army, from meeting, are only very briefly successful in that goal. Harry and co. still end up storming the Ministry at the end of the book and film to retrieve the prophecy. The security theatre of Rufus Scrimgower, who replaces Cornelius Fudge as Minister for Magic at the opening of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, is even worse, seemingly helping Voldemort rather than hindering him. This is most clear in the example of Stan Shunpike, who, after being sent to Azkaban despite not actually being a Death Eater, ends up joining them. 
He may be under the influence of the Imperius Curse when he does so, but this does seem to say something about the manner in which draconian laws and vicious punishments can often serve as a further recruiting tool for terrorists, keen to portray society as unjust rather than as an impediment to them. The broader ineffectiveness of these interventions has some bearing on real life too. In 2015, the Washington Times reported on a Justice Department document which suggested that FBI agents couldn't point to any major terrorism cases they'd cracked thanks to the key snooping powers in the Patriot Act. And if these interventions aren't all that successful in stopping guilty people from doing guilty things, then the only real effect they seem to have is on the day-to-day -day lives of innocent people, creating an atmosphere of fear and suspicion and obliterating any expectation of privacy. More crucial to the present day, however, I would argue that the Harry Potter series encourages us to be highly critical of any and all institutions which govern our society. Yet, this seems to be at odds with the way in which Harry Potter has been mobilised in political discourse in recent years. Critiquing what he refers to as middle-class liberals' love of Harry Potter as political theory, RJ Quinn has written that the books are the ultimate revenge of the nerds, where the liberal priesthood of experts, technocrats and wonks can retreat into a twee-closeted fantasy world. Early on, the series does seem to support a worldview which suggests that we should put our faith in the cleverest among us and build a world in which an elite intelligentsia are given the power to use their smarts to govern us as they see fit. Even the very idea of there being a hidden society in which those with magical gifts pull the strings and that being a good thing seems to channel the ideals of 19th century liberals such as Thomas Carlyle or Walter Baggett who were highly distrustful of democracy believing that most people simply weren't smart enough to choose who governs them. I broadly agree with Quinn that this is the way in which Harry Potter has been mobilised in political discourse in recent years. Whatever one thinks of Trump's presidency or the UK leaving the European Union, and I'm certainly no fan of either, both were the result of democratic processes. In drawing upon Harry Potter as a lens to understand these, the implication often seems to be that the blame falls in the lap of democracy itself. We don't need to rethink how our democracies function, we'd be better off instead just shelving it all together and letting a benevolent clerisy of Hermione's and Dumbledore's govern us instead. Yet, as I read it, both the Harry Potter books and films increasingly become a critique of such a system rather than a celebration of it. The wizarding world is full of elite institutions, supposedly led by the brightest that wizarding society has to offer. Dumbledore has almost unending control over what happens at Hogwarts, and although there are one or two references to elections for the role of Minister for Magic, much of this society seems to operate on a process of appointment rather than election. Yet the series shows us how easy it is for such institutions to be turned against us. Though when they're controlled by those that we agree with, we might clamour to give them more power, we soon regret this once they come under the grips of those with darker intentions. As I said at the opening of this video then, while I occasionally find the use of Harry Potter as a way of explaining our present political moment a little simplistic, I don't want to ridicule anyone for doing so. Drawing on fiction as a lens for understanding the world around us is nothing new. It's happened with Shakespeare for centuries, for instance. Yet. I do wonder whether those who draw on these stories as a way of promoting a less democratic world run by those perceived to be in possession of greater intelligence, which it must be said is a highly subjective metric, might benefit from reading a little bit closer to uncover what Harry Potter suggests the consequences of such a system might be. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, then please do consider sharing it with a friend who might also like it. Uh, thanks as always to Ash, to Michael V. Brown, to Jay Fraser Cartwright, to Army of Me, to Sintry Nielsen, and to Kaya Lau for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here, then you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thanks once again for watching and have a great week.